imagine a mountain river flowing backwards? Given the force of gravity, that's impossible, right? Then how do you explain how blood from the veins of our legs is constantly flowing against gravity all the way to the heart? Well, it's all thanks to the properties of our heart and veins, with veins playing a crucial role in preventing the blood from stagnating in our extremities. You can imagine now that once this mechanism fails, it creates issues in the blood flowing from the legs. These issues lead to a condition called varicose veins or varices. Varicose veins are fairly common in certain populations and there are several ways to treat them. In this video, we'll help you understand what varices are and how they occur, what the different types of varices are, as well as what symptoms they cause. And in the end, we're going to describe the most common surgical ways of treating them and how they can be prevented. Now let's start by answering the question, what are varices and how do they occur? As you may know, veins are blood vessels that transport blood from our tissues towards the heart. In order to overcome gravity, veins have small protrusions within them called valves. The cusps of the valves are pointed slightly diagonally upwards. This shape and position prevents the blood from flowing backwards and collecting in our tissues. Venous varices occur when the valves are damaged. That leads to blood stagnating in the veins, increasing pressure on their walls. When such a state is prolonged, it leads to dilation of the veins, which we call varices. Besides the varices, another important mechanism is the support that veins get from the surrounding muscles. When we walk, our muscles contract, pressing on the adjacent veins, helping to pump the blood towards the heart. So a sedentary lifestyle, or a profession that requires long standing or sitting, promotes the development of varicose veins. The most common site where varices develop are within the superficial veins of the legs, which are located just below the skin, just like this one here. Risk factors for developing varicose veins are excessive weight and pregnancy, as well as sedentary lifestyle and family predisposition. They are more common in women than in men. Due to hormonal influences, women are prone to weakness of connective tissue, for example, cellulitis, with the same applying to the vascular system. Also, women tend to have naturally less muscle mass than men. I can hear you wondering now about the different types of varicose veins, so let's now move on to that. There are several different types of varicose veins. The first type are spider veins, which can be seen as very thin purple lines, a little bit like spider's legs, on the skin. This morphology is due to the smallest of the superficial veins being affected. The second type are net-shaped or reticular varices, which are a more advanced form whereby the branches of larger superficial veins are affected. They are thicker than spider veins and more bluish in colouring. Stem varices are the most advanced stage of varicose veins. And as you can see, they are large, tortuous and palpable. These varices are most significant from a medical aspect. Besides visible varices, other signs and symptoms of varicose veins include the feeling of heaviness and tension and tiredness in the legs, which is particularly pronounced in summer and in the evenings. Because of blood stagnation, legs also tend to swell. These symptoms can worsen with prolonged periods standing or sitting. Also, some people get cramps, tingling and sensations of restless legs. However, patients often feel immediate relief when putting their legs up or when lying down, as this eases the blood flow and reduces the force of gravity. Varicose veins are important because of potential complications. If not treated, the disease can progress up to a point of forming ulcers on the legs. Although not so frequently, a thrombus, more commonly known as a blood clot, can develop in these veins, and from time to time, they can even rupture. Luckily, there are several ways to treat varicose veins. And even more luckily, not all types require surgery. Early forms are usually treated by preventing the disease from advancing into more severe stages, usually by introducing exercise into one's lifestyle, weight control, as well as using different types of socks that compress the superficial veins. However, due to the physical forces of gravity, there is no medication that can reverse or cure varices. More severe cases of stem varices usually require a surgical intervention. Increasingly, surgical methods are becoming less and less invasive. The most commonly used surgical method is the stripping method. However, besides stripping, there are other, less invasive procedures such as endovenous laser surgery and radiofrequency therapy. 
Before any types of varicose vein surgery, ultrasonography is always performed. On the one hand, this ultrasound examination can be used to assess whether the deep vein system is healthy and patent. Only then may a varicose vein be removed. On the other hand, the sonography images make the dilated vein sections visible. This enables the physician to draw an outline of the veins on the patient's skin before the procedure. Stripping surgery can be conducted in partial or general anaesthesia. Which anaesthetic procedure is chosen depends on both the extent of the procedure and the patient's health and wishes. As it's a fairly standard procedure, most patients will be treated as outpatients, with only complex cases requiring a stay in the hospital. Let's take a look now at what's going to happen in the operating room. If you're going to have a surgery, after the anaesthetic kicks in, the surgeon will make a small incision, a couple of centimetres long, on the skin of the knee or groin region. They will then locate the diseased vein and disconnect it from its branches and tributaries. A small wire will be inserted into the vein and then be pulled out together with the diseased vessel. This way, the pathologically changed vein gets removed from the leg. At the end, your skin incisions will be sutured and the doctors will immediately bandage the leg to minimise the risk of bleeding or swelling. Stripping is a routine procedure and fairly safe. As with any surgical intervention, there is a risk of complications, such as reaction to anaesthetic medicine, bleeding, infection, bruising and nerve injury. However, these are rare. Bruises, swelling and mild pain are the most common side effects in the days following the operation. Nevertheless, patients are advised to get up as soon as possible and to wear compression stockings. Exercise in moderation is also encouraged. All of this aims to set the muscle pump in motion and thus supports the removal of the blood, which in turn promotes healing. Follow-up appointments will help to observe the healing process and in most cases, after four weeks there are no longer any restrictions. Thanks for watching and stay healthy! This video is a part of KenHub's limited clinical series and is for educational purposes only. It does not provide medical advice and none of the information in this video should be used as an alternative to a medical exam, specialist diagnosis, nor treatment. If you're feeling any health disorder symptoms, please contact your doctor.